as I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying there's a revival of communion that is coming to the world mm. where we at the table see him revealed for who he truly is. Hey guys, so uh, we are here with our friend Bill and um, we wanted to, Bill and I have been talking back and forth, Matt and I have been talking back and forth a little bit more about um, people that we really wanted to hear their perspectives on different things in the spirit, especially as Natalie and I have been valuing more and more really what the Lord's saying now, because there's yeah. thousands of things that any of us can talk about or focus on, but really what's, what's the Lord saying now, what's happening now. And Bill's um, one of those people that we really value and respect and trust his heart in this process. Yeah, we, uh, we met you a few years ago at some conference, series of conferences. I think the first one was a virtual one. Or did you come in for that one? I can't remember. You know, the first, you know, the first time I met you guys, uh, it was up in Detroit at Floodgate, right? So we, yeah. we, so it was Chris Gore, I think was supposed to, or no, somebody was supposed to be there. No, I, I got I to back. Graham Cook was supposed to be yeah, there that's at right. a root canal. And somehow it, it Somehow, uh, my number got called at like eleven o'clock at night. <laughs> that sounds about with right. This idea that can we fly you out at six o'clock tomorrow morning to come speak at a church that you've never been to? <laughs> Graham Cook's recommendation. I went, ah, what am I going to say no to Graham? Right. So, <laughs> so, so there yeah, you were. Yeah. The next day, I found myself on a flight to to be at uh, at you guys' place and. Wow, that was a crazy event. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that really was enjoyed that. But but meeting you guys, you know, there there are treasures everywhere, and uh, and meeting you guys was really a treasure. It was it was, I, I just really I felt like every now and then I meet voices that I feel like are emerging that God has uh, placed the seeds of reformation in the soil of their heart, and given you uh, both intellectual capacity. And, and, the, and the boldness and courage to give language to it when the time is right. I really feel like for you guys, the time is right and the time is now. So I'm super excited to, to have this conversation. Well, I didn't expect that. I'm going to go cry now. So this is a great oh, conversation. That's normal for her. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, um, so I, so, um, you know, you know, that we feel very similar too about just your, your heart posture and the stories that we've heard. And I think the thing that so impressed me the first time I met you was the simple story that you said that you felt like you were on a mission with your speaking to, to get Jesus's reputation back. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, that was the first thing I'd ever heard you say. And um, it just so the, the simplicity of that vision struck a chord in my heart that obviously I still think about it now. Right. Wow. <clears throat> so, so I think that's what we're really interested in talking to you about is um, we're in a time and season in the earth right now. There's so much movement. There's so much transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel uh, the people that I talk to and me personally, I feel a, a movement uh, from the Lord that I've, I've never experienced before. Yeah. And so I think the, the conversations that we have are really important. And um, we're, we're really interested in what do you feel like the Lord's saying and doing now? Well, we're in a period of reformation right now. And part of the reformation is, has to do with uh, 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 an, an emergence of a freshness of revelation of the new covenant. In recent, recent years, we have a problem in this, in this nation, the body of Christ in this nation. And that is that we've received new covenant salvation, but we live old covenant relationship with God. So there's a couple of ways you can kind of tell how this works. I mean, we actually, we, we preach old covenant messages. We proclaim old covenant prophecies. We, we live this kind of this, this sense that God is going to completely flush the new covenant at any moment, and go back to the old covenant. And why does that even matter? Well, because if we don't understand what, what Christ accomplished in the new covenant and the finished work of the cross, then we put on display a, a misrepresentation of God. And I think you can see the evidence of that, that 2,000 years after the cross, people are still really confused about what he's like, you know? And, um, and, and so I, I've, had this, I've had this real sense that there is a, a need to return to the table, that the church of the future isn't a church that's a stadium, it's, it's a table. Hmm. And around the table, like Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the two, two guys on the road to Emmaus, he walks seven miles with these guys and they don't recognize him until he sits down at a table, breaks bread and blesses it. And at the table of communion there, he's seen there, he's known. Well, when Jesus 
first did this, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, my broken body and my blood that's shed for you. And the revelation of the new covenant shut down an old covenant system once and for all and inaugurated a completely new relationship with God. And so it's not that God changed, it's that he brought us into a, a different level of relationship. It's like the same thing with Jesus when he did with the disciples, when he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. What happens? He changed? No. He's brought us into a new, a new depth of relationship. And each uh, relationship uh, that he, he brings us into from one covenant into another is a greater uh, revelation of intimacy with God, a greater revelation of, of union with God. And... Uh, uh, but the new covenant is very different. It's two major things about the new covenant that people have got to understand. And this can kind of launch people into a whole new world mindset of understanding God. The, the first one is that, that every covenant that was made uh, prior to the new covenant, prior to the cross, was made between God and man. So God would make a covenant with man, then man would mess up, break the covenant, and God either does one of two things, depending on the covenant they're under. Either God makes a whole new covenant, uh, new rules, new terms, or God punishes man per the terms of the covenant. Mm. So we call that judgment. And the way that God would do that is he would tell a prophet, send a prophet to the people and say, you're way off track. You've broken the covenant. Here's what's going to happen to you. And the people wouldn't receive the prophet until the judgment came. Then the entire nation collectively goes, oh my goodness, this was true. God was speaking truth. And the entire nation would turn repent. There'd be like a season of revival through a couple of Kings. Yeah. So you had this cycle that just repeats over and over again in the old covenant, but here's the deal. The new covenant is not made between God and man. Hmm. In Isaiah 42, six, God says of the Messiah, he says, I will give you as a covenant for the people. So basically what he's doing is saying, there, there's going to be a, a, a new kind of covenant made. And it's not going to be between God and man. We're just going to have an animal sacrifice. No, there's three things you need in order to have a sacrifice. You need a high priest. You need a sacrifice. You need a holy God sitting on the throne receiving the sacrifice. And God says of the Messiah, I'm going to give you as a covenant for the people. So what you see is all three of the elements needed to create a covenant God does himself. He's the great high priest, he is the sacrifice, and he's the one sitting on the throne. So Jesus Christ fulfills all three things necessary to shut down an old covenant system and inaugurate a new one. But the new covenant system is not made between God and man. This is super important. The new covenant is made between Father and the Son. God the Father and God the Son. <laughs> We're not even in the mix there except for one thing, and that is 1 Corinthians 1.30, by his doing you are in Christ. So he brought us into himself, right? So here's the beautiful thing about the new covenant. You didn't make it. You can't break it. It's made between the Father and the Son. They're not violating the terms of the covenant. So it's everlasting, eternal. The new covenant will always be new. Mm. Here's that's, that's the big one. It's made between the Father and the Son. You can't you didn't make it, you can't break it. You can't change it. You can ignore it and pretend like it's not there, but you can't break the new covenant. All right. Second thing, and this is probably the biggest deal of all. Um, and that is, think about this. In the last 2000 years, since the cross and the resurrection, when finally the old covenant system was completely done away with, with the cross and the resurrection and breathed its last at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, when that was all completed since that time until now in the last 2,000 years, got to ask yourself a super honest question. Every pastor that's watching this has got to ask this honest question here. Has God judged a nation or the church collectively where we knew he was doing it and we all understood it when it happened to the point where we all turned and repented, but I'll just give you the answer. It's no, it hasn't <laughs> happened, right? Which is, okay, so, so I want you to stop and think about how many prophets you hear today prophesy that judgment is coming. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> what we're doing is we're still using old covenant methodology to engage people in a relationship with a God who's 
brought us in by the spirit of adoption into a father-son paradigm, a father-child paradigm called family. It's a kingdom. That's why he's revealed at the table. And in this family, there is judgment, but it's not collectively as an entire church or an entire religious community or an entire nation even. Hmm. It's individually. So like Hebrews 6 says, God, who he loves, he chastens and scourges every son who comes to him. For if he doesn't chasten or correct you, if he doesn't correct you, are you even his child? So the fact that he acts like a father to us individually validates our sonship, right? Mm -hmm. So there is judgment, but it's individual between you and God. He's not holding us as a group at arm's length and having to send prophets to us. He's given us the exact same Holy Spirit that any prophet has. So what he's doing here is he's trying to bring us into a, a greater degree of intimacy. Here's the deal. Every single time you hear some prophet get up and talk about the coming judgment, God's judging the church, God's judging the nation. I just want to like go liar, liar, pants on fire. You're living in an old covenant world. Stop mm -hmm. motivating people through a fear-based idea that is warping our perception of what God is like until we bring people into a revelation of the new covenant people are going to continue for the next 2,000 years, if need be, to be confused about what God is like mm. and who he is. But I, I love, I heard Eric Gilmore say this last Sunday. I thought it was so beautiful. I don't know if it's his quote or if it's him quoting Spurgeon, but he said, he said, when you know him, truly know him, you want nothing but him. Mm. When you don't know him, you want everything but him and everything distracts you. And I'm looking at the church being distracted by everything but Jesus right now. Hmm. The political spirit and the religious spirit have headlocked the church in this, in this crazy game of, of, a, of, a, of a religious body that's more interested in being right than being one. And that, that division so wars against what Jesus came to bring in the new covenant that we can't look at the present, the present state of the church and read John 17 and see ourselves reflected in Jesus prayer. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, we are more divided now than we've been at any point in my life. So I'm getting super adamant right now, as I feel like the Holy spirit is saying, there's a revival of communion that is coming to the world where we at the table see him revealed for who he truly is. Hmm. So, so this new covenant revelation that all of the judgment was absorbed once and for all in Christ mm -hmm. on the cross reveals that now the Father is giving us this, this mandate to put his glory on display in the earth. To uh, to shine with with the with the revelation of this is who Jesus is. This is what He is like, so that people are motivated by love mm -hmm. rather than fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. And that that is that has been that has been a stronger and stronger message in 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 my in my bones lately. You talking um, about just the last part that you said or the whole thing? The whole thing. I mean, really, but but there's something about we've. He's got to be seen for who he truly is, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and 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 his plan A is to put himself on display through his people, mm -hmm. like taking up residence in us by his spirit and saying, <laughs> "Now go into all the world, you know, preach the gospel." It's it's not it's not like he did. He didn't say go into all the world. And then get everybody to say this prayer and then put a check mark on your Bible and then move on to the next person. He said, go make disciples preaching mm -hmm. the gospel. The gospel's good news. News is reporting what has already happened. What's already happened? He he died and rose again. And in that resurrection, validated our innocence, imparted his righteousness and holiness to humanity, mm -hmm. brought us into this reconciled union with the Father. And it's not even our fault. We didn't ask his permission. He did it while we were yet sinners. He died for us. The good news is news of what has already happened. Mm -hmm. And if we if we don't believe it, we have a completely different experience than he intends based on the fact that we live the experience that we believe. Mm -hmm. But when we believe that what he did 
actually includes us is for us. Oh my goodness, it changes everything. Now we begin to step, step into the, the new covenant revelation that salvation paid for in blood. And we can enter into the rest of that reconciled union and realize we are one with God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he did that. That's the gospel. When people see that, man, they see Jesus and they go, more of that, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. They let go of all of the lies that they believed about themselves, all the labels that life has put on them. And they find themselves just, just falling headlong into the grace of, of the God who's known them before they knew they could be known. Mm, that's so good. That, did you have anything? Yeah, I, I was didn't just going to preach a sermon there. But no, come on. <laughs> it's so good. Well, and it's, it's really a part of my story, what you're saying. Um, you know, I was saved when I was three years old. My mom taught Sunday school, you know, gave my heart to Jesus as a child. And growing up, the only thing I wanted to do, people would ask me what I want to be when I grow up. I said, I just want to do whatever God wants me to do. <laughs> or I wanted to be an inventor. There was two and the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but but in the midst of that, there was a lot of wrestling for me as a child and a preteen growing up in a Pentecostal church um, where I wrestled with that religious spirit, that thing that told me like, I'm never going to measure up and I'm going to always be a disappointment to my father. And, and I had amazing parents. Like my, my parents were amazing. They, I did not get that from the natural. It was just something religious that was, I don't know, it was put on me or whatever. But um, when I was 16, on my 16th birthday, I was at I IHOP conference, one thing, and Jason Upton was was singing on my birthday. And I, I encountered- talking to Jason this week. What a great Oh, guy. he's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, his ministry really um, helped shape my relationship with the Lord in my like late teens, early 20s. Wow. And uh, and so the, my, first, my first experience, like hearing his, him sing and just worship and the way he ministers is so incredible, but um, he started singing, he's breaking off rejection with the spirit of adoption. Yeah. And I was on my birthday and all of a sudden I, I felt the Lord say, this is you. I'm like, what are you talking about God? <laughs> like, <laughs> I've known you my whole life. I've done every, like everything that I've ever done has been for you. And he's like, no, this is you. And so I ran down to the front and for the first time encountered the love of the father um, like truly encountered it. And I was just undone. And I, I can, I can say that from that moment, like it marked my walk with the Lord and my, the, and how I expressed, you know, Christianity. And from that point on was an encounter with the love of the father an encounter with grace, like true love and came and like encountered me and pursued me in that place on my birthday <laughs> and changed my life. And so I, I deeply resonate with everything that you're, you're talking about because I've lived it um, even growing up in a church, even in a church environment. So you know, maybe there's people watching that that's you where like, I grew up in church. I know all this stuff, but, but like, there's a deeper place of encounter with love that he just wants to mark us with. Like you're saying, I think it's what he's drawing the body back into a reset into understanding the love and yeah. the grace of the father. When we, when we push away compassion, the love of the father, offense becomes a result because you cannot carry compassion and offense at the same time. I, I feel like there's a, there's a sense of, um, I mean, you can, you can love somebody and when you see somebody who you love being hurt, you can definitely like feel for them and you want to like stand between them and the person's, but that's, there's difference there. It's, it, it, I'm talking about a spirit of offense, mm -hmm. Bull jettison compassion. They jettison the love of the father offense just seems to somehow fill the void and fill the vacuum and that offense. Uh, it, it looks like righteous indignation to people, but the funny thing about the, the, to a lot of people. And, and they can put it on display as that. But the thing is, is when compassion, the compassion of the father hits your heart and grips you, you become unoffendable. And it's not that you become tolerant of sin. It's not the point. It's just, it's you've refused to let uh, uh, the lies that people believe about themselves and even what they put on display deter you from loving them. And that love makes you you know, like, let's say, Natalie, you walk away from that experience, what ends up happening, you radiate the compassion of the father's heart. And that love makes you a living, breathing invitation for somebody to come and know the authentic Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and when we don't have that, 
that when we end up is we we end up preaching about a god that you better love or else mm -hmm. and so people end up coming to into a sort of a relationship with god because they come into a relationship with a belief system and and when they come into the relationship with the, that belief system without actually because you know i'm scared to death of god but i want to believe just enough to get saved right oh, like not believe you know so so when people come into that that kind of a belief system though then they walk according to like just tell me what to do just mm -hmm. give me the rules <laughs> tell me what i can't and can do and then they end up walking <laughs> powerless so we have a massive amount of the body of christ that literally walks powerless and and uh, because you just don't see the, you don't see them pursuing going after invading the impossible or seeing the miracle working power of god actually flow through their lives because there's a measure of belief you can believe enough to be saved and you can believe enough to like actually see uh, the power of God move through your life where you're pursuing, uh, letting the kingdom just flow through you to impact the world around you. But there is a measure of belief where if you keep looking at him and you don't look away, then you start to know his heart. And that's where everything changes. Suddenly there's this, this intrinsic awareness that there is no distance and no separation between you and him. It's hard to figure out where he begins and you end. And, and the reality is, is that that's exactly what he's meant for this to be, you know, in that day, he says, John 14, 20, you guys know me, this is my, this is my, my verse. In that <laughs> day, you will know I am in the father and you are in me and I am in you. I mean, I just, I, I meditate on that. My mind just blows, blows up. But here's the crazy thing. I can't, I can't even begin to meditate on that verse. If I haven't yet understood that I'm accepted by a good father mm -hmm. who calls me his child, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's such an important part of, I think, I think, I think about the way, I mean, the way I grew up, my dad was, um, uh, he was an incredible man. I would say an incredible man of God and carried such a compassion for people. And it, I mean, I would, he he'd just stop everything to just lead a homeless guy to Jesus. You know, he'd, he'd bring people you know, into our home and just share the gospel with them until they were just weeping. It was all about just knowing him and just, and he was that living invitation to an authentic relationship with a loving God. Mm. And I, I watched that. I grew up seeing thousands of people's lives transformed by it, had the biggest impact on my life that, that anybody ever has had was, was, was that. Mm. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm. There's, there's so many layers, man. I wish there's so many layers to what you're saying. And like the actual words that you're using are, are so good. I'm not sure that there's a way to unpack some of the layers that you're actually talking about. But one I would like to ask if you've got more explanation to is you talked about the difference between stadium and table, I'll call it table Christianity. Sure stadium and table Christianity, because it kind of ties in with what you're talking about even now. Um, and, and there's, um, uh, I think especially right now, I see a lot of people shifting locations with where they do stuff, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not about location. And no. I think sometimes when people hear the word stadium versus table from the stadium to the table, like what you were saying right at the beginning, <clears throat> um, people take portions of what they're currently doing that they don't align with and then they move to a new location but they bring all the same paradigms with them and right. they bring all the same old covenant stuff do the same them. stuff at the table as they did in the stadium right. right and it's and it's no different and um you know we've we've seen people go through that process and um and so I think one of the big things that we always think about is how do we participate in people's growth and so I wonder if you have any thoughts about when you start talking about um, kind of being shrouded in love for the father, getting out of old covenant into new right. covenant thinking, but then specifically when you talk about what I'll call table Christianity, um, what are some, what are some differences? Well, I can hide in a stadium. I can't hide at a table. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's yeah. so good. And, and I can go to a, I can let's say, just call it, a, call it a large gathering, big church, whatever. I can go to a stadium and I can, I can receive information and I can walk away feeling 
feeling like I have grown in my mind. I can go home and I can take the seeds of that. I can meditate on them a while, but the, the, the table doesn't allow me to just walk away with information because at the table I'm known and I, I am vulnerable. And now, uh, in the, in the stadium, I can get information, but at the table where there's intimacy, there's transformation. Mm. And that's the place I think where, where, uh, where God finds us. He meets us right there at, at the table. And I can sit across from some, that's why, you know, we, we always say, well, you know, we, we only have people at the table that we like. Well, God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Why? So that enemy can come to the table and discover he's actually your brother. So when I'm in a room with an enemy, let's say I, I figure God should be handing out weapons, you know, and give me the bigger weapon, right? Because he likes me better. And, <laughs> and, and yet he's already told me what I'm supposed to do with my enemies. I love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Which again, also begs the question when people are constantly talking about like God's about to come drop the hammer of judgment. He tells us to love our enemies. Why do we think he's going to do something different with his? <laughs> Never figured that one out. So anyway, he brings, he brings us into a, a place where we sit down to break bread before our enemy. Why? So Christ can be revealed. Christ in us? Yeah. But Paul looked at barbarians and Scythians in, in Colossians 3.11 and says Christ is all and in all, even in the most hated, violent people groups of his day. And people say, well, wait, wait, what do you mean? He, Christ was in the barbarians? From Paul's perspective, that's what he adopted as a perspective. People want to know, is that a reality? It's not the right question because they're thinking, well, if that's not true, then I'm not going to live it. You know, it's like, if I look around and I see wickedness in the world, then Christ is not all in and all. And whoa, time out. What if we just adopted what Paul said? And I'm sitting across the table from an enemy and I look at that enemy and I go, I'm going to purpose that I'm not going to see your barbarianness." in front of me. That's not, that's a, that is a, that is a false identity that God never intended for you to carry. Mm -hmm. The authentic you, the destiny of who you are supposed to be is in Christ. So let me just, let me just pretend that Jesus is sitting in front of me instead of my enemy. What would it be like now, my interaction with that, that person is that I'm going to regard them with a level of honor and respect and compassion and love and care in a way that puts the father's heart on display. So it really is a perspective issue. Um, same thing with, um, with uh, Peter in Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes to the, the home of uh, Cornelius, the, the Roman centurion, right after he's had the vision of the sheet coming down from heaven with all the, you know, the buffet of lobster and whatnot, bacon and everything <laughs> in it. He gets from that revelation, he says to the, the Romans, he says, guys, God has told me that I'm not allowed to call any man unholy or unclean which is an astonishing revelation for Peter to get. Mm -hmm. So Peter goes from being a distant separation guy between me and these pagan Gentiles to going, I, I, I've been taken to the woodshed by God. And he's told me, I have a restriction on my life. I am not allowed to call anybody unholy or unclean. So for Paul, it was Christ is all and in all. For Peter is like, I'm not allowed to call anybody unholy or unclean. I'm thinking this is what the new covenant does. It gives us kingdom eyes, new covenant. It's like, it's like, it's like new covenant lenses to where when I put the lenses on, I'm like, whoa, all I can see is the holiness of God blanketing humanity. Like, like the spirit of God hovering over the waters in Genesis one, you know, mm -hmm. where, where the earth is without form and void and darkness is on the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovers over the waters and speaks light into the, the waters. That's that to me is exactly what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus with those two guys who are walking along and he's just talking. And when he gets to the end of the road and, and disappears at the communion table, they turn to each other and they go, did not our heart burn within us as he talked to us on the road? Like, was your heart burning? Yeah, mine was burning. What was he doing? What's Jesus doing as he's just speaking? He was saying, let there be light into the soil, the formless void of humanity. And just speaking that creative word. Well, what are we called to do? Jesus said, of, he says in John 20, as the father sent me, I send you. Mm -hmm. 
So what are we releasing into the world? We release voices of offense and judgment and all this stuff, or we can put the Father's heart on display. And I just, I, everywhere I look, I look around and I see formless, which is an identity that's like, but is, is without form. It's fluid. Everything's fluid now, right? It's all fluid and void, empty. Well, what do I do? Do I curse it? No. Hover over it, engage with it, mm -hmm. recognize, let the blanket of the holiness of God begin to like, just ignite something within you. As you speak, what are you, what are you doing? When you're putting Jesus on display, you're saying, let there be light. That's what Jesus was doing to the guys on the road to Emmaus. It says he goes through the entire Old Testament and he opened up in the scriptures and showed them where he was. So Jesus is witnessing to them about Jesus, which is kind of funny when you stop and think about it. <laughs> so there's, I have another question. Do you have another question? No, go for it. So, all right. So <clears throat> we're talking about this table because... Um, so let's say that we've got a table full of 10 people and there's two enemies that have sat down and we're, and we're, you know, people are trying to engage with the reality that you're talking about, which is, you know, to not see the barbarian as the barbarian yeah. kind of a thing. <clears throat> but how would you balance? I'm, I'm the practical guy. So I always go into the practical side. So let's say that you're at this small table. And what I love is that you're kind of forced in a relationship because you've chosen to sit at this table. So this is where you are. And the dude across from you does keep trying to stab you with a sword and doesn't stop trying to stab <laughs> you with a sword. And you're like, but I love you, but he still keeps trying to stab you with the sword. What, what, is the, what is the practical application to this New Testament reality that you're talking about living in when in tension, in a scenario sure. of tension? How do you navigate that? Well, you know, Paul said, let's say like in first Corinthians six, when there was somebody that was part of the body, they were coming to, to the, to the church and they were, um, they were actively engaged in a life that was having a negative effect on everybody at the table hmm. at that point. And that's the one time where you see Paul go, okay, you know, uh, and this is the phrase that he uses, deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. For whatever reason, people like to talk about that and then they cut it off right there. But the next line in the verses is, is really, really mysterious. He says, deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. Mm. Now, I don't know what you do with that, but Paul apparently <laughs> had a, I mean, that's like, that's a theological head scratcher for some people. I got some ideas, but I won't go into them here. But, um, you know, Paul, his, his whole point was, listen, it's, it's really all about, it's really all about for the betterment of everybody here, that the, the, there's salvation for this guy. And then later on in the next letter, he says, you know, restore such a one lest to be overcome with sorrow. So restoration was always the goal. There's always a seat at the table, but when, when a person starts to bring destruction to the table, there is a, there is a place of protecting, you know, the intimacy that we have at the table. That's why he says, mark those who sow division among you, you know, uh, watch these, some of these folks. I think, you know, this we had with like Ananias and Sapphira, this is a new covenant story. You think, whoa, God's judgment fell on these people. Well, n these people weren't part of the table there. There was something going on here that's deeper. It says that, that uh, Peter goes, uh, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Well, Satan doesn't fill your heart accidentally. You, you, have to, you actually have to partner with that, right? So these weren't people who were actually part of the body. These were people who came in who actually had had partnered with satanic influence, to, like intentionally, hmm. so that for the purpose of somehow coming in, infiltrating and like deceiving the body. What were they doing? They were literally in there to to, to wreak havoc and sow dissension. So Jesus never had a problem with people who were misrepresenting themselves. He did have a problem with people who were misrepresenting him. Yeah. And he had a problem with people who were bringing harm to others. Oh. So th that, that's the big deal. If a person, you know, that's why I think, you know, the, the, the drunks and the hookers all love Jesus. Why? Because they weren't misrepresenting anybody but themselves. Yeah. They were just believing lies about themselves. They weren't making any statements about God. Jesus had zero problem with these people and they fell in love with him. Why? Because when he saw them, they were seen and they were known. Mm. So one thing to hear, you know, you, somebody say, you know, Jesus loves you. It's another one for, to hear him say, I know you. Mm -hmm. And so 
but then when it gets to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, these guys, they they think they've got the corner market on what God is like. And so they're mis, they're misrepresenting him. And I think Jesus is saying, look, I'll correct all your misrepresentations of you, and that'll be done in tremendous compassion. But you come in misrepresenting me and bringing harm to the body. Oh, it's, you know, this is the millstone moment, right? <laughs> this is the part where it's like, you don't misrepresent him, which I think we, we have, we do a lot these days. And, uh, uh, and so much grace for it. I mean, honestly, if God was going to judge, he's going to drop the hammer of judgment on us. I can think about a thousand times in the last two years that it probably should have <laughs> happened, right? <laughs> so I'm just seeing God pour more grace out on us than, you know, we could ever deserve. But thanks for the new covenant. Welcome to the new covenant. Mm. Um, or as, as my friend uh, Jim says, uh, says if a blood of a goat could cover the sins of a nation for an entire year, I mean, honestly, what do we think the blood of the Lamb of God actually did and how long does that last? Mm. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, but kind of coming back to your question, I know I, I rabbit trail myself off into a whole other universe, but <laughs> coming back to your question, if I'm sitting at a table and I got, I got people that are sitting there and they're enemies, are they misrepresenting themselves or are they misrepresenting God and bringing harm to the body? Hmm. Those two things right there, there was, there was no, no tolerance in Jesus for that. That was the point where you start, that was the point where you start flipping tables and calling people whitewashed tombs and telling them that their dad's the devil. That's the part where, you know, uh, is there grace in that? Sure. Sometimes I think in, in language, we, we grab a hold of words that cut through the noise to move completely counter to what these people think about uh, God or think about themselves to the point where it's broken off. Of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you see it, it have an effect on guys like Nicodemus. One of my favorite stories in the Bible that um, I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach about is, uh, is when uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea go get Jesus' body off the cross, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, I think it's in John 19, where, um, you know, it's, he's so freshly dead, Pilate has to ask, is he dead yet? And, uh, and, oh, and dead. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Uh, it, it, here's the reason why that story is so fascinating to me. And that is that there were two groups of people that Jesus said would be really hard to get into the kingdom, the rich and the religious. And Nicodemus represents religious. Yeah. And Joseph of Arimathea represents the rich. Oh. They go and ask for the body of Jesus when everybody else is forsaken it because all the expectations have been crushed, shattered. They think there's no, there's no hope. And what, what do they do? These guys go to Get the body off the cross. Think about this, the part that gets me. He's been beaten beyond human recognition, according to the prophecy in Isaiah. He is, there's probably more blood on the outside of his body now than there is on the inside of his body. And he is freshly dead, meaning that he's still wet. So these guys, with their hands, are going to pull the body of Jesus off the cross, wrap it up, put it in a tomb. So this is the part, the rich and the religious are the first, these two representations of these groups of people who'd said it was going to be the hardest for them to get into the kingdom, vicariously stand to the, the, the people who are the farthest out there in humanity to be the very first to get the blood of the slain lamb of God, mm. the sacrifice for the sin of the cosmos on their physical hands mm -hmm. that just wrecks me mm -hmm. so i i don't know i just look at that and i go in in every leg of the story just when you think you see somebody and like oh pff, no hope for them they're too far gone they're you know ah, man you, you you start to see the impact and the power of the blood of jesus and if he can redeem the unredeemable to that extent oh my goodness mm -hmm. what a yeah. Anyway, mm. I, I don't know. I just, I, I've watched too many lives transformed at the table of communion. And that is in relationship. Um, two, well, nights, two nights ago, I'm just sitting with a guy who's missionary comes out of a, a fundamentalist evangelical background. And we're sitting there until 11 o'clock at night around a table. Every Tuesday night, we have a little table gathering. 
and we're sitting around the table and he's just unpacking this like we're just unpacking the gospel and talking about the goodness of God. Next thing you know, we're both just overcome with this joy. He's got no grid for this stuff, but the Holy spirit just kind of slams into both of us. And we just have a moment where we just realize, wait, we're not having a conversation between two of us here. Mm. There's a third in the mix here. And uh, yeah, he's revealed at the table, something about that. And it turns enemies into friends. There's, you know, there's, when you first started talking about the table part, and I asked you that question initially about conflict, realized that I asked you that question thinking about the person sitting across from me, but then realizing too, that the the really cool part about that table is that that forced confrontation is also when I become the barbarian for a period of time, (laughs) kind of forces me, like I was asking that question about somebody else, but I'm like, wait, this is also for me, because there's times when I have a little dagger in my hand, I'm trying to do this with people. Yeah, but you, <laughs> we get went kickboxing yesterday, so she punched me. I have a bruise. <laughs> so, I do too. So <laughs> I, I sent Tracy to Krav Maga one Ooh. time. I, she she wanted to take Krav Maga, and so I was like, "Yeah, go for it." So she started taking lessons. So she comes home, wants to show me what she's yeah, learned. Yeah, exactly. Right. So she gives me like a couch cushion. So we're gonna spar using this <laughs> couch cushion, right? And we had this like Shiba Inu chow mix dog that was sort of like a little miniature German shepherd who was just beautiful and fierce. And I I realized in that moment, I'm not the alpha in this house because I'm holding this couch (laughs) cushion and Tracy goes to like kick me and the dog attacks me. (laughs) I'm like, what is happening right now? (laughs) This dog's going to help her attack people too. Good. (laughs) Wrong, wrong person. <laughs> Attack the aggressor. I like the way that when you talk about this table portion, the way it forces, um, you know, sitting at a table with groups of people also forces me to a position of confrontation with other people who have chosen to pull up to a table intentionally so that my own barbarianness doesn't get to spin itself into a frenzy yeah. alone basically. I mean, interesting is this is kind of what you're talking about is it's possible to be in a group of people, but totally alone spiritually. Totally. That's, I think that's why, that's why it's super attractive to go to a massive crowd, uh, you know, church, which I, 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 I'm not against. I think, I, I, I don't think of those gatherings with big crowds and whatnot. I don't, I don't think of those as church. I think of it as school. I think of it as training, Hmm. training grounds where every element that we get involved in becomes a point of training for life. You know, what we, what we learn to do in the church and generosity and kindness and love and whatnot becomes kind of an ex, hopefully becomes an external expression of the world. And when we're sitting there listening to somebody talk and preach, you know, for an hour or whatever, we, it gives us, it gives us, there's a value for having, having a, a heart of a student and to learn how to be a listener. Those two things alone are worth it just to go and sit there. But again, I can be in that mode and I can, I can hide, I can collect information. I can intellectually feed myself. I can enjoy the worship and feel like collectively I've, I've, I've expressed, you know, love to the Lord in a, in a, a congregational environment, walk out feeling like I've been part of the body. That's fine. But true transformation comes when I'm con- confrontable, you know, um, again, Graham Cook, I think, said, if you can be corrected, you can be trusted. And that requires giving people the freedom to speak into your life, you know, and at a table. I mean, I got, I got friends, I got friends half my age who will challenge me on stuff, you know, at my table, you know, <laughs> table I'm sitting at, no, this is my house, my table, you know. <laughs> so where you're like, get out. Yeah. Well, I've, I've done that a couple of I've done that a couple of times. And if they're watching this, they know it. It's true. You know? <laughs> but that's okay. They always stay. I mean, they come back and, and my door is always open, you know? Mm. Um, but it, I mean, it's, it, we have a, we have a really tight, um, not closed, but tight, tight group of, of friends that all carry ministry. I would say ministry graces and gifts. And at, at least once a week, we all gather together. And there's no sense of um, hierarchy to it. It's just, it's a, it's a group bound by honor. Nobody has any, any uh, roles or positions. They just bring graces and gifts to the room. And, and then it's like a, it's like a potluck of a spiritual potluck. Everybody just kind of puts the, their gift in, in the middle of the table and, uh, and offers it up. 
and we do eat physical food and whatnot. We have a time of worship where Jesus, you know, is, is glorified. He's always the center of everything, but there's always, and there's always a time where we open up the scriptures and we spend a good hour just going through the Bible and, and hearing what the Lord's saying uh, to us and, and educating ourselves in the word. That's, that's a big deal. Uh, but the greatest times that we have, I think, are, are just the times of spontaneous conversation, you know, kind of like we're having here. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that to me is the, 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 the meat at the table. Mm. Yeah. Do you think um, a lot of the identity issues we're seeing being expressed in the world right now are a result of this kind of stadium Christianity that, you know, the scripture talks about many teachers that, but not many fathers Sure. of there being a generation of people that have been taught, but not fathered. Um, yeah. Because the father yeah. gives the identity. Yeah. Identity comes from the father. Bloodline comes from the father. The father's heart defines us. And, uh, and yeah, with, without, without, um, without a revelation of the father's heart, we don't know who we are. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's, that's a huge deal. I mean, you guys see it, I know around you and we see it around us. Everybody's asking the question, who do you say that I am? Mm. And, uh, uh, I had a, had a fascinating um, conversation with a dear friend of mine, Lynn Hiles. Um, probably shouldn't have mentioned his name. He's a, he's, he's a known heretic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love Lynn. He's a tremendous. Best book on Revelation ever written, I think, is, is uh, Lynn's. But uh, I, was, I was down in Miami doing a conference with Lynn a while back. And um, it was back when all this whole wokeness and stuff was starting to come out and 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 i said uh, it feels like the next generation is dead to the gospel and lynn is a super gentle just the kindest kindest man but he kind of like pushed back at me a little bit and he said you remember when jesus was uh walking along and the lady with the issue of blood comes up and touches him of his garment I said yeah and he goes you ever ask where jesus was going i said no <laughs> he said he was going to heal jairus daughter and uh and he says, and, and he's detained for a bit. She gets her healing. He moves on, but it detained him long enough where she's not just sick anymore. She's dead. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they tell him so. And he says, she's not dead. She's sleeping. I'm here to wake her up. So, so he goes in there and he takes, he pushes all the mockers out, brings the parents and three disciples in, goes, takes her by the hand. Says, little girl arrives. Then first thing he says is give her something to eat. I go, yeah, I'm, very familiar with the story. He goes, well, let me give you a prophetic application for today. He said, uh, we've been praying for a great awakening, haven't we? And he goes, uh, and, and Jesus intends to bring it. And he's on his way to bring it, but he's going to bring it to the next generation. He's just being detained by an older generation who still has issues in our blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. As, uh, he says, <laughs> we're, we're putting demands on him. And, uh, and he says, but then you know, when, when he gets to where he's going, um, we, we yell out, Oh, she's, she's not sleeping anymore. She's dead. And he goes, or he's not, she's not sick. She's dead. And he goes, no, no, she's just sleeping, which here's the crazy part. She was dead, you know? Mm-hmm. And he goes, no, she's not dead. She's sleeping. His reality is different than our reality. And his reality is more true than ours, even no matter what we think. And, uh, and he goes, and I'm here to wake her. And then Lynn says this, he goes, I'm here to woke her. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, think of the language that young people are are using right now. It's it's language of awakening. And think what you're saying when you're in that language. Like when you use, when you, when you're up in the morning, get up in the morning, roll out of bed and you're like stumble, you know, down the stairs and, and, and somebody comes up to talk to you and say, don't talk to me right now. Cause I'm just waking up. What are you saying? I'm transitioning from one state to another. I'm not sure where I've been and I'm not sure where I'm going but I'm in this middle zone right here and I am just waking up, which makes me super vulnerable. Right. Interesting. So now you have an entire generation essentially saying to the world, we're in like this super vulnerable stage wow. state where it feels like we're waking up to something, but we're looking for an awakening. Like, wow. and the church is going offensive, you know, wow. not realizing they are giving language to the very, it, their, their language is the answer to our prayer. We've been praying for a great awakening. Now we're hearing awakening language within a generation we think is dead. Mm-hmm. And where God is actually saying, listen, you got, if you put me on display, 
for who I truly am. If Jesus is put on display for who he truly is, the next generation will find their awakening and, and we'll see the revival that we've been, been praying for. I think of, um, just uh, reclaim the word woke. <laughs> <laughs> redeem it all. They were going to redeem it. Uh, I, I think of, um, uh, two huge prayers I've heard prayed in my lifetime are God, we need to get the church out of the walls. Um, you know, church has got to get out of the walls. Mm -hmm. How many times have I heard that? And we need strong families. So we have like promise keepers and I still do and all these like family building things grow up. And, and it really is about getting parents to value spending time with their children and pouring into them as fathers and mothers should. Then COVID hits. The church is forced out of the walls and people have to stay home with their kids. <laughs> I get online and I hear the body of Christ freaking out going, we're not going to close our churches. We're going back to the building and my kids are driving me nuts. And I'm like, Oh my God, we don't actually want what we say we want. I'm, I'm and then we blame it on the government. We blame it on all this stuff. And we're like, we're like, Oh my goodness. We don't actually we don't want what we say we want because when we when we want something, you know, like we get up there and we say we need this, this, and then the means come about by which we can actually get an answer to our prayer. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, it's revealed that that our heart didn't actually want what we said we wanted. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm I'm beginning to realize that on many levels we exercise that, mm -hmm. but God has a way of answering our prayers in. I don't think God did COVID to us, but he's not going to waste it. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's... It reminds me of that clip we just watched from Mike Bickle What's talking that? about creating. We, literally, like right before this, we were watching a clip from Mike Bickle. Um, it was talking about God creating, like answering our prayers by creating the environment by which those prayers can be answered. And it doesn't Absolutely. feel the way we want it to feel or like the way we want it to look, but it should be our intention to say yes to those environments, knowing that he's bringing us exactly what we prayed for. Mm -hmm. It's true. I think most of the time, if we would like write down prayers, we would maybe go revisit the, the written prayers that we wrote down like five, 10 years later, we'd realize God answered every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And none of them were answered in the way that we asked for, mm -hmm. but yeah. somehow in the answer to the prayer, there was a process brought about that did something in us that challenged something that needed to be challenged. Mm -hmm. That's the, the process of um, praying for things and then realizing that what you thought you want isn't the actual thing that you wanted. <laughs> that has been, man, you, we want to talk about the furnace of the last couple of years, especially for me. I think, I think that's maybe one of the things that a lot of people, where a lot of people are right now, as they're examining their own hearts is realizing that for the past few years, they've been praying for certain things, but then realizing that they actually want something different. And for me, it's been very, um, I don't, humbling isn't the right word. It's been very confrontationally revealing and it's forced me to change my actions. Realigning. Yeah. It's forced mm. me to align my, my actions with what I've been praying for. And I think that's also maybe a portion of what people are doing. And, and it is a big part of what even I hear you challenging people to do, maybe not even purposefully with this, this kind of paradigm shift is that there's going to be a lot of people who need to re-examine what they've been praying for and what they're seeing happen. And it's going to create a really difficult moment where they're going to have to change some of their action, whatever that may be, yeah. to align. Like even when we're talking about this, one of the things that I'm thinking about action wise is there's some there's some transitions that I need to have in mentality with the things that I say or the way that I speak, but it's a choice that I then get to go face to face with and you know mm -hmm. confront. Am I actually going to align with the thing that I say that I want? Well, yeah, because the process isn't our enemy. The process brings us into you know grace upon grace and glory upon glory. So mm -hmm. yeah, say yes to the process, and we can trust that he's going to get us where he wants us in the end. Mm -hmm. one, one of the prayers that I uh, consistently pray, and I don't know if you guys have this happen or not, but in the times with the secret, in the secret place with the Lord, he reveals things to your heart. And sometimes most of the stuff I feel like he reveals to me are personal between me and the Lord. And I, I and that's just feeds to the intimacy, you know, that I have, I feel like we, we are all called to develop with, with him when he sees that you protect the secrets 
that he reveals to you in the secret place, then he reveals more. It's like he's looking for people he can entrust the secrets of his heart to. Mm -hmm. But as as he he'll reveal something, I feel like that that becomes more of an impression that I don't have language for yet. Mm -hmm. So this this is the consistent prayer, and that is God, give me language for this. Like, like help me to language this out in a way that that will make sense that will not just teach others, but teach me, you know? Uh, and so like when I go to preach at a church or whatever, and, and I'll get an impression from the Lord of what he wants to say to the church. And uh, I, I don't often have this thing where God says, I feel like God says specific words, thus say it the Lord. And then word for word, these you things wanna... happen. It's more like an impression on the heart. And then I get to choose the language of how I communicate it. But part of that language is not just the words that I choose. It's the spirit of the sound that I release. I know that your speech is more than sound. And, and so there's something about this, this, uh, this thing where I'm, I'm always saying, God, give me language. And when I'm saying that, it's not just about the words. Again, it's about, God, give me, give me a sound to my spirit that when, that when I say something that it, it carries all of the, the, uh, all of the freak, the resonant frequency of heaven behind it that accurately puts you on display. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been a, that's kind of been a big, big challenge lately is mm -hmm. somehow going, you know, God, give me language for these things, some of these things. Mm -hmm. And he's always faithful to do it. And it, I always kind of walk away going, wow, that, you made me sound so much more intelligent than I am. <laughs> I had no idea where that came from. And, and I got to go back and listen to it again. So I can remember, like, I, I can, I can repeat again, you know, what just sort of like fell out of my mouth. I think John the Baptist did this when he saw Jesus come down to the Jordan river and he just looked at his cousin and went, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm. I mean, I feel like John probably just went, what did I just say? Like, what, what was that? You know, because there was so much wrapped up in that statement that transcended anything John could have made up from his own head. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. When, when you guys, um, when you guys talk about the, you know, the, obviously this thing at the table is a passion for, for you guys. What do you see the Lord doing in this, uh, this move, in a sense, from the stadium to the table? Oh, well, I mean, I think you hit on it a little bit with, with families, um, just, you know, parents, I, I hear, you know, we have four kids of our own from 12 to four, and um, we have a lot of friends that are in the parenting season. And so um, I'm hearing more and more parents say, we just want, we want to teach our kids how to love Jesus and we want to do it together. And, um, and seeing, you know, yeah, it's, and, and, and yeah. actually, in this season too, like, you know, as I've stepped back from kind of public ministry and inside the four walls of a church, I've seen it firsthand of the power of yeah. um, being intentional in uh, seeking the Lord with your kids, not treating them like a distraction from the holy things, but treating them as, you know, like you were talking about seeing every, all, God in all things, Christ in all things and, and drawing them to the table and, um, you know, reading the scripture together and worshiping together and really listening to what they're saying um, when they're talking about the Lord, because there's so much revelation in the things that they say um, in the way that they're, they're hearing from the Lord and, and really validating that, yes, that's the Lord, that's, that's Jesus speaking to you. Let's, let's pray into that. You have a revelation of that. Will you pray into that for our, over our family? And, and seeing um, families do that, but not only in like the family unit, but in the broader sense of, of small intimate groups, like you're talking about coming to tables and having a meal and, and worshiping together and really ministering to the Lord together and ministering to each other. Um, we're just seeing so much in, our, in this region. We're seeing so many people drawn to that expression um, and kind of figuring it out, trying to figure it out, I guess, mm. you know, have something you want to add to that. I mean, I guess, you know, when you talk about <clears throat> pulling up to the table, it's, uh, I think that there are certain people who naturally have this natural level of empathy, compassion, care for people. 
<clears throat> like Natalie does. And um, then there's people like me who have to choose it. And um, what, I, what I recognize is that going to be more intimate in the expression of faith is, uh, again, just reveals a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of areas where like, I know I can walk into a room and win the room over by being charismatic. Like it's not hard for me to get people to like me. But it's, it's what I realize is, is the amount of times that I used to do that, but I would draw people to me for myself and yeah. use a lot of words that expressed love and care and compassion and friendship. But when that I really examined I those, I wouldn't actually show up for those people. And that was, it was hard for me to realize that I didn't love people like I thought I did. And so when I think about this, the, you know, the small and the intimate and um, the kind of laying down of the need for a platform that I've been through in the past few years. Um, I feel like these small, the, 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 uh, the intimate environment of being at the table with people regularly, the environment itself creates that. And yeah. um, it's, uh, I've talked to a few people who have been in an intimate environment and I ask a lot of questions of people. I'm like, what it created this change that you're talking about? Like I hear people saying like, man, I just feel like empowered. And I feel like, like I'm living more consistently between being with people and then being in my life and my work. And I'm always asking like, what created that? And they're like, I don't know. It's just something about pulling up to a table with people. Yeah. And the biggest, I think the biggest thing is watching the amount of life that it's drawing into people. And therefore, the kind of extra level of authentic love that's coming out of people in that process. Yeah. That level of, I think that's it, is that the, what appeals to me so much about finding a, a deeper intimacy there is the amount of authenticity that comes out of it. Yeah. That's the big part for me. Because you have to be, like you were saying, you have to be authentic or you either have to shut up or be authentic because whatever what you say is going to reveal you. So um, or, you know, how you act is going to reveal you. So, yeah, I think it, it is. And it, 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 it's the, the method or the, the way that Jesus modeled really is, you know, that he had the three, the one, the three, the 12 yeah. and the hundreds and the thousands. And, and uh, they didn't all get the same access. They didn't all sit around the same table. But yeah. Um, yeah. And I haven't really understood until fairly recently how much community people lack in general. And I feel like that's a major, at least for my own life, the thing that I want to participate in in this next season is that I feel like the Lord's really highlighting community in, yeah. in, in my own life. And I feel like it's being like, you know, like when you buy a new car and all of a sudden everybody has that car, like you see it all over the place. It was when this word kind of got highlighted to me, I started listening to other people and realizing like, wow, like none of these people have community and so they attach themselves to various different things that may or may not be healthy but it's for this longing for community mm. to try to find a place where they, they can have relationships yeah yeah, um, yeah i think that you you're you're tapping into an a growing growing need mm. Uh, especially, you know, following the last couple of years where people are, you know, felt like a sense of isolation and they're just like, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going somewhere, I don't care, you know, and uh, they're really clamoring for uh, an authentic community connection. Mm -hmm. One of the things after 30 years of pastoring, I, I have come to the realization that uh, if I put Jesus on display, I can have limited contact with people, but it can last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I put me on display, then I have to be the one that takes care of all their needs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there, are, uh, there's a very limited amount of people that I can give that level of care or access uh, to. And so uh, I, I, I feel like wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, if, if Jesus is seen, if he's heard, if his spirit and his presence is felt and, and experienced and people have an encounter with the Lord and I got a chance to facilitate that, then there's a bit of a handoff that takes place. It's kind of like saying to somebody, I want to introduce you to my best friend, you know, um, you know, in, in silver and gold, have I none, but this guy can give you legs, you know, it's like, <laughs> so, you know, uh, 
it's so funny <laughs> yeah i'm stealing that we're gonna cut this part out so nobody knows where i got it from <laughs> you know i mean it's like he could, you know here he can do so much more for you my limitations are obvious you know his limitations are so so i'm gonna go ahead and hand you off to you know and uh uh, uh i listening to um minister that I love named Alistair Begg and he was talking about the the thief on the cross and thieves on the cross whatever you want to say depending on how many thieves you think he took home and so uh he says uh he says picture the thief on the cross when he gets to heaven and the angel the angel looks at him and goes why are you here and the guy's like I have no idea why I'm here how'd you get in and he points to Jesus and goes well he was on the middle cross and he said I could come he was like, that's all he knows. He knows no scripture. He knows no, he's like, he said, I can be here. And the, the, to me, it's like, that's, that's all we do is we just, we just give people, we point people to Jesus. And I think there will be times, you know, that God empowers us to be, you know, that, that, um, that uh, vehicle of compassion, you know, to people. But when he, when it's his idea, he gives you the grace to do it. And it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like work. I mean, it feels like this is an incredible pleasure and it gives you tremendous satisfaction when it's our idea. That's religious motivation alone. It's not the Holy spirit generating it. It burns us out. It makes us feel like I don't ever want to do this again, puts us in, in dangerous situations. And so, you know, it depends on whether it's a God idea or our, you say, well, does that mean, you know, loving people is, a, you know, an option? No, it's just the means by which we love people. You know, I could say I love everybody. I see everybody as holy and clean. I look at seeing Christ as all in all. How I express those things to people and how I lay down my life for those people mm -hmm. is going to be empowered by the grace of the Holy Spirit, or it's going to be empowered by my own ability. Mm -hmm. And my own ability, you know, goes about that far. The grace of the Holy Spirit can empower you to fly. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always conscious that, you know, there's times in my life where I felt the Lord say, you know, I'd see, I'd see a need and I'd hear the old mission statement. The need is the call. You know, you don't have to like ask for a call. The need is the call. And so I'd suddenly see myself getting pulled into it to a need. And I would feel the Lord saying, this is your idea. You're on your own here. You know, uh, you can do good here, but you'll, you'll only be able to give yourself. And, uh, and so then I asked the Lord, how do, how do I put you on display? How do, and sometimes God will say things like, I'll get the impression of, oh, here's a person that, oh, I'm going to network this person with that person. And this is one of the ways that I think that we empower people in the body of Christ, especially as leaders. So as God in, increases your influence, he gives you the ability to maneuver people into position where you recognize a grace on their life to be able to, to be the answer to the prayer that, that that you can't be in this moment that he's not going to allow you to be. Mm. So uh, that's, that's become a, a kind of a learned skill over the years. And that is the power of in business, what they call it delegation, but in the kingdom, it's really, it, I, I call it king making, mm. you know, which is, I think part of what we do So we, we take people who are priests and Kings and don't know it. And we show them how to be mm -hmm. um, who they actually are. Mm -hmm. yeah. so you know you know you can go you go into a room and blow it up with charisma i mean both of you guys do you both of you guys just light up a room you walk in it's like oh my goodness who, who couldn't love you guys but then there comes a point where it's like at some point in the conversation in the relationship in the connection with people in community and around a table there's a handoff where jesus shows up and starts ministering to people beyond your human limitation and your capacity. And uh, I, I mean, I remember being in a meeting one time um, and healing broke out in this meeting. Guy got out of a wheelchair. There's about eight or nine creative miracles that happened. And I'm, I'm on the platform. I feel like the Lord says, leave the platform. I leave the platform. I walk down to the pastor and the pastor goes, what do we do? Should, somebody should probably like get up and do something. And I said, I think we should go to lunch. <laughs> Excellent. And he's like, really? 
He goes, I am kind of hungry. I'm like, okay. So we all, <laughs> I love that that was his response. Oh, yeah. I am kind of like, hungry. <laughs> like we, we just kind of slipped out and left. And an hour later, we're sitting there. We're, I went to Chili's, oddly <laughs> enough. I don't know why I remember that. Terrible restaurant. But, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever's around there, right? And so, um, and we're sitting there at lunch. And about an hour later, he's still getting texts of people that are still getting healed mm-hmm. in the room. And it's like, why did you leave? I think it was in that moment. It was kind of, I wouldn't say it's a hard and fast rule. That's, I can think of like one time that I felt like the Lord said we were supposed to do that. That I think it was really important that the people in the church see that it was, it wasn't about the guy up front. It wasn't about the person. So there are times where it's not, it's not beneficial for God to move through us Mm -hmm to make us look super brilliant and anointed. I think the days of the days of the superstar thing that that's kind of coming to an end, all that comes crashing down at the table. And uh, uh, because we've moved from, we've moved people from um, honor to idolatry. We do it super, super easy. Mm -hmm. And you move somebody from honor to idolatry when you can't, when they can't be corrected anymore. And so it doesn't matter if they're a pastor, prophet, or politician. Once a person goes into a place where they are uncorrectable, we've moved them from honor to idolatry. And God never warms up to idolatry. He just never seems to like it. <laughs> so so no, it doesn't matter who we make an idol, even no matter how anointed they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, the minute we take something God has anointed and we turn into an idol, it, it's, it's almost like we've canceled out its ability to, to come to its fullness in, 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 in our lives. So, I, I, I find that it's kind of a big deal that, you know, I'm like, God, thank you so much that you've allowed me to be the one to, to love this person, to care for this person, to meet the need of this person, to, to, you know, see this person healed at my hand. That's super cool. But there comes a point, I think, where we all kind of feel like if we're, if we're really leaning into the Lord, if we have an awareness of union with him and we're listening to, to the voice of his Holy Spirit, there comes a point in every minister's life where you begin to realize if I don't hand this off to somebody else, if I don't delegate this to somebody else, or if I don't step back, uh, I'm going to step into a place of, of being an idol in this person's life. Mm. And uh, uh, I think, I think the Lord is really teaching a lot of us about that Mm -hmm. and why that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. You're really hitting on a theme. um, That's the Lord's been walking me through probably really the last, long time, but, um, especially the last like six months or a year, um, about, you know, really walking in humility and, and understand, like coming into the full understanding that it's Christ in us, not us with the microphone (laughs) and that he's the hope of glory. And like, without him, we can do nothing. And so, you know, just what you said, just that the moving away from, uh, idolatry of a, of, a, of a person or a, or a ministry or, or whatever. And to re- truly become the nameless, faceless ones that shine his light and his, his love into people without needing validation, you know? Right. Right. And at the same time, uh, I, I mean, we apply, I apply it to people that I look at, right. And I look toward, like, there's a lot of people that I really admire in the body of Christ. But I realize, my goodness, if, if I feel like I can't get a word from God, unless they give it to me, I've put them in a dangerous place. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like, I'm a part of the prophetic community and, a, you know, prophetic company round table and whatnot. But I begin to realize, you know, uh, that, that we've, we've taken prophetic people and we've like elevated them as if they have a greater anointing and great. And I'm like, wait, they have the exact same Holy spirit you do. So true new covenant prophets will be teaching you and me how to hear the voice of the Lord for ourselves. so We can actually cultivate a relationship of intimacy with God. So if I think that I can't hear God unless that prophet tells me, that's not a prophet, that's a cult leader. Mm -hmm. And that's of my own making. Like I've done that. It's not that they've set themselves up in that place. I've done that. And, uh, you know, we just got to stop doing that in the body of Christ. We got to look to people and let them inspire us you know, but, but not become, uh, not become idols, you know, there's just no place for it in, in, in the kingdom. Well, I, um, 
I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts. Um, I'm uh, looking at both of you guys staring at me. <laughs> I'm getting sweaty. Um, <laughs> I hope that uh, that's Natalie. That's not me. I'm not. <laughs> On you. Um, I was just I'm. I don't. I have nothing else to say. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think in the in the multitude of the words, hopefully, I, mean, I feel like there's there's people that have watched this that that you know maybe ninety percent of it will be irrelevant to them, but there'll be a ten percent that'll be that'll just like go whoa that that and so I, I hope that there's some prophetic thread that runs through this that captures people's hearts in a way that that uh, gives them a, a a hunger to you know. To, to crack open the scriptures and i'd say go to like go to hebrews 6 go to hebrews 9 mm-hmm. find out what jesus did go I, i'd say somebody wants to take after this this podcast is over and say well, how, how can i like how can i like dive headlong into into everything these guys have talked about go to luke 24 and read the story of jesus on the road to emmaus Read John 17 and, and the, the great high priestly prayer of Jesus about our unity, that we would be one. Um, read John 14, 20 until it burns into your retinas, you know, uh, and, and, and think about what would it be like if I believed this was actually true? Mm. You know, uh, just, just grab a hold of, of the new covenant with, with both hands and don't let go. Mm-hmm. and uh and see where this journey takes you because it'll take you to a revelation that god's better than we we all think mm-hmm. and we can't imagine him better than he is <laughs> yeah that's good well, i like your multitude of words so thank you for oh man thank you this has been super fun for me mm-hmm. see, the difficulty is that you got my brain to a place where like i can participate in conversation for a certain period of time but when you hit too many wheels and get too many wheels spinning at He's the same time. He's going in the processing zone. Now he just like zones out at a wall. processing zone. So now I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And now I have no more words. So, no, but we, we really appreciate you. Yeah, thank um, you so sharing much. Sharing all of this. And um, so I, I want to I break this back down. Well, since we don't get a chance to talk a whole lot, and we'll just keep this thing recording because I think it would be fun. <laughs> what do you, you guys seem like such fun people, whether it's road trip or what? I mean, I am. I see, okay. I <laughs> see, I see your Instagram. I see your like, social media. Beep, beep. We, spent, we, spent like, we spent like an hour and, and 20 minutes talking about the kingdom. So let's keep the kingdom thought going with a completely different thread here. What do you guys do for fun? Like, like how do you guys stay so fun? <laughs> how do you guys stay so fun? Um, Just well, tell them about what I do. What do you do? I don't know. All the fun things that I do. That's how we stay so fun. <laughs> he just sings stupid songs all day and I pretend to punch him. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. What, what do you mean stupid songs? You just, like you, is it random? Sometimes. Like what's the chicken can? <laughs> so I've been calling you Bill Vanderbilt since For the a long very time. first time that I heard you speak. So I'm pretty sure I've made a song about you at some point too. Okay. Probably. This is, this is my wife. This is Tracy. Exactly. I'm, I wish she could come in here. If she can hear me talk in the house, I wish she'd come in here and sit in on this. She, her entire life is interpretive dance and random songs. And we could be like driving down the road and, and a song will come on, you know, like flipping through Sirius XM or something. And some, some song will come on. Tracy, give me an example. What's the, what's the one we did, you did the other day? Oh, eighty classic eighties song, uh, an OMD song called um, "What's the Chorus?" Touch you once, touch you twice, won't let go at any price. Th- these these words need action in Tracy's mind. <laughs> I can mean, be like driving down the road, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I have to act this song out. So we're gonna be like poking you. We're gonna be grabbing you. That sounds like something I would do. <laughs> oh, this is totally. This is this is my life. It, d- depending on what song comes on the radio, there will be a a, a human video, an interpretive <laughs> dance. You know, yeah. So I I still don't totally have Natalie figured out because when I met her, I thought I was the extrovert and she was the introvert. And I don't. I still think that's true. She's a secretive 
kind of like ninja. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we both work out. I own a fitness business. That's interesting, I guess. Nelly kickboxes and punches people all the time. Hence the bruise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to skydive. She likes whitewater rafting. We like to hike through mountains. Come on. Pretty much we just want, like, I, my, one of my favorite things is to go to a new place Shabba. and just like Habibibibi. explore a new place and see new things and <laughs> taste new foods. And yeah, just, we will live on an ocean one day. Just like, that will just, happen. and do it together. Let's do it together and just have an adventure. Live in an ocean and, together? No. Well, yeah, if we move. I'm talking about adventure. We're going to move together. Or Mary. Oh where, have you, where, where have you lived? Where have you guys here, moved? Here. It's only here. Oh, boring. Michigan. So, so so Tracy and I started out in Dallas. Uh, yeah. We went to Bible College, like Christ for the Nations. Right after we got, we, we graduated high school, we got married because it was cheaper to go to Christ for the Nations. <laughs> <laughs> if you're married. <laughs> oh, yeah. We were like, yeah, at 18. We got married at 18 because wow. it was, it was going to be more expensive for us to go as singles. And we could we could save a lot of money if we went as married. And I'm like, yes. And of course, the rapture is happening any day. And we, <laughs> that was another incentive to get married because you know we wanted to have sex and not have God mad at us. You're right. <laughs> so, Rapture's uh, coming. Might, might as well get hooked. <laughs> that, that was back in the day when it was super imminent. Like Jesus was coming back, where we, the trumpet was going to sound, and. You know, those of us who had, had the purity rings from the True, True oh, yeah. Love Weight Conference. And the Left you know, Behind series. All the oh, books. my gosh. We listened to all those. My, we did a lot of, like, road trip vacations as, like, kids and teens. My mom would get the audio books, and we just, like, listened. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the uh, we, we always had this idea that if, if the rapture happened and we weren't married yet, you know, and we were being raptured as virgins, we'd be like, no! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I felt that way, too. <laughs> So we, right after we got married, though, we, we went into straight into ministry and pastoral ministry. And for 12 years, we stayed in one place. And then, I don't know, uh, when we left Austin, uh, we pastored in Austin for a dozen years. And we left Austin, man, it was like a rocket ship to adventure land. So we went to, we lived in Maui um, for a little while. Uh, we moved here to Orlando. Uh, I mean, we lived on the ocean. We li we've lived everywhere, but well, we did live on the side of a mountain in Maui. That was that was a mountain. That's cool. And there was snow on it, you know. But <laughs> I mean, I, I was scuba diving with sharks like mm -hmm. five days a week. It Come was, on, it was insane fun. It was great. Now I'm to the point where, you know, I hurt myself checking my blind spot or <laughs> sleeping at night. I'm like, I don't like pain anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah our, our most exciting routine these days is getting up in the morning and running over to chick-fil-a and getting a sweet tea <laughs> Christian chicken shop chick-fil-a come on we, we only <laughs> recently sound... got chick-fil-a we didn't have chick-fil-a in michigan Ooh. until like a year and a half ago Speaking and then my love language what? now they're like popping up all over the place they're like yes but isn't, yeah isn't it amazing how they're always crowded Always. Yeah. yeah, I've never seen like an empty Chick-fil-A. There's a lot of people who have a love language like me. What, Chick-fil-A? Yeah. <laughs> you would, I feel like you would just drink the sauce if you oh, could. Oh, just... Mm. I mean, I like the sauce, but not that much. Not as much as you do. It's so good. It is good. That does sound really cool, though. Scuba mm -hmm. diving from the side of a mountain and then it getting Chick-fil-A afterwards. I think getting Chick-fil-A. It is super. Yeah, it is super cool. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, if you want to make... If you ever want to like ruin the smell of your car forever... Just leave Chick Fil A fries in your car <laughs> overnight. I don't know what they put on those fries, but somewhere after about the eight-hour mark, it goes so rancid and gets into the very fabric of your vehicle, mm -hmm. and it's just—it's not good. So Natalie has shin guards that she uses when she boxes. All of those also smell very bad. I feel like it's similar to a Chick Fil A <laughs> fry. <laughs> <laughs> le they're leather you can't like you can't get the smell out it's I think bad it's similar it's so bad Na natalie's natalie's knee sweat smells like <laughs> chick-fil-a eight hour old <laughs> waffle fries, fries. <laughs> it's, yeah it's real i don't know that i want that branding <laughs> anyway <laughs> It, it's, that is your new brand no i, reje I reject this no, you can't i'm your husband 
that's that's not Lou Diggs. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it. You need to take an old carton of Chick Fil A waffle fries and one of those sweaty knee guards and just do a smell <laughs> test. It just <laughs> we're gonna have them perform an experiment next next time. <laughs> I, I got that. a pretty solid gag reflex, but that might challenge it. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, you guys bolted all that stuff then. You guys, we what? I mean, you, you. What did you say? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calm no, down. Both did. Oh, both, both. Of they us? said no. bolted. Did, was she Tracy, into scuba diving and stuff Tracy too? She does not do the. She does not do the water thing. Okay, she doesn't so, leave big fillet he fries doesn't, in her he's car. He's scared either. of open water. So. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, hey, listen. It, I took my son. I took my son diving for the first time when he was probably like twelve. And he said, "Dad," and I saw sharks every day. I mean, I was filming. I was doing underwater video- videography. And, uh, and, and I said, uh, okay. So I said, uh, what are you going to do if you see a shark? And he goes, I'm going to like run on top of the water on the surface of the water, get back to the boat. <laughs> and I said, you know, you think you will, but I said, when you see a shark in the ocean, don't ask me why. And it's, this is true. Uh, unless you're on the surface and you don't have anything to look under with. Right. But if you see a shark in the ocean, there is a ridiculous amount of desire to swim toward it. Mm. It's super bizarre. Hypnosis. So, is. Well, no, it's, it's a thing. It's not like the movies, you know, in the movies you have the boot music, the dum, 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 <laughs> dum. I mean, there's that. Right. And, uh, and it's super quiet. And, and for whatever reason in the movies, every time a shark opens its mouth, it roars. It's like, it's, <laughs> happen. it's not true. Problem is the ocean is, I mean, if you, I don't know if you guys scuba dived or not, but the ocean's incredibly loud. I mean, every little like shrimp or whatever that's like clicking at a rock or every clam or whatever, it just, it's crackling constantly. So it's almost like you're, you're going, this can't freak me out. There's too much noise happening here. Like it's, it's not silent. It's incredibly loud. Mm-hmm. And so when, and when you get down there, you begin to realize, you know, man, these, these creatures are just they're just doing life. I'm not food to them. I'm just, I'm just in the neighborhood. I just ha- happen to be hanging out. So the first time my son's 12 years old and we're, we're diving together about three miles off the coast of Maui. And all of a sudden here's a shark right there. And would you know it? He's just like right down. <laughs> it. He's right after it. I mean, if he could have caught up to it, I think he would have like pet it. I mean, it's yeah, it, it was just like, I got to get closer. I got to see this for real. It's true. Happens to everybody. I've never seen anybody underwater. Never was diving with anybody underwater who, who saw a shark and didn't just stop in just absolute awe. Hmm. Yeah. So we'll do it. And then we'll give you our feedback. <laughs> Wait, just for context. I want to go. I want to go with you guys. I, we gotta <laughs> so for context, we, we were just in rock wall visiting some friends for a ministry retreat thing. And, uh, we're, I don't know if you've been at Rockwall, but there's this big lake, like man-made lake called Lake Ray Hubbard. It's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of murky and scary and big and <laughs> kind of murky. <laughs> so there's paddle boards at the Airbnb we were staying at, and so like, let's go out. And nobody else wanted to go out with us, so it was, we're out in the middle of the lake, yeah. and uh, see monsters. Nate's like freaking out because he sees a fish like just swimming by his board and so uh you were freaking out it was out. practically an alligator <laughs> no it was like <laughs> it was like this big it was like this big clearly just like a freshwater like a pike or something yeah you were way too calm he was like ah! like trying not to fall off his board in the water it's like babe it's gonna be okay it's not gonna eat you smacking the water hitting the fish yeah. with- <laughs> no you don't want to do that the noise brings him <laughs> <laughs> noise brings the monsters but i love water too yeah so that's weird it's a, it's a weird uh i'm terrified of but being underwater like scuba diving and snorkeling is like it's only I, if you can't see i would love to go scuba diving yeah love it i, I was down in belize one time um a friend of mine we were we were like oh let's go do let's go do like a shark dive right so uh they they took us to a place where sharks always hang out have for years and uh and there's a, there's a spot. I mean, we pull up in this one spot and we go to just hang out. It's, it's like maybe 15 feet deep or whatever. And there are so many sharks, you can't see the bottom. I mean, they're, and they're just like, like crisscrossing on top of each other. 
And the guy on the boat, this, okay, this is how, I guess this is how stupid or confident uh, one or the <laughs> other, kind of hard to tell is like a thin line there uh, that I've become over the years. So this guy on the boat goes, oh, quick, jump in before they swim away. And I'm standing up on the edge of the boat and I've got my mask with me, no fins or anything. I just got, I got my mask and I put the mask on and I'm, I'm in the water. Like I dive right <laughs> into the middle of this like shark soup. Right. Wow. And I'm down there and I'm just like looking around and swimming around with them. And one's coming along here and I just reach up and, you know, touch like this. Finally, I realized nobody else is getting in here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> just it's insane come to the surface and the guy everybody's like hanging on the edge of the boat like thinking he's You're a dead. dead man right <laughs> and so i swim over to the boat and i crawl up in it and i'm like i i'm i'm assuming now i wasn't supposed to do that <laughs> and, and the guy told me i was a crazy something or other and <laughs> yes he's like no we do not we do not jump in here <laughs> Like, I instantly don't trust your opinion on human psychology <laughs> in the water. No way. No. Whatever you just said about swim towards the shark. <laughs> There's something wrong with you. There's <laughs> something wrong with that. We did actually all get in the water a little ways away and uh, a little little further out when we're from, you know, where they were. And, uh, and we did have some cool encounters. It was just a lot of fun. But yeah, apparently I wasn't supposed to jump in on top <laughs> of the massive school of sharks there. Were all these, or all these trips that you're talking about, were these all like ministry trips that you did cool stuff? Or is this you, you guys just traveling together? Uh, both. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things we do that are cool uh, happen. Places we go to minister, you know. Uh, wherever actually wherever we go to minister we try to find cool stuff to do mm. and uh you know like when we come we've come up to michigan uh to be with you guys a, a few times up there and we always look for something cool to do one time we went over to what's the little town that the ford motor company built up there oh you're talking about the henry ford village thing yeah yeah the village yeah detroit. yeah we went yeah. detroit <laughs> yeah yeah whatever that is it was it was cool that was super sweet Another time we went over to uh, to get some insane Mediterranean food. You know, we walked around downtown. It's like we've looked at everything we could possibly. Look. We just try to find the coolest stuff there is to do mm -hmm. uh, wherever wherever we go. So some of those have happened on ministry trips. Others just are like, oh, let's just go do this. Let's do a destination thing mm -hmm. and just and go hang out. Yeah, that's or, when we go to travel to you, that's one thing that we really love is like, we're, we're definitely into like, find the coolest stuff that you can find in the area. But if you go somewhere that's cultural, like another cultural, another yeah. culture, what, you know, like Belize or whatever, our tendency would be to find different restaurants that, that yes. depicted the culture and be like, well, what would you have? Like, what's your traditional dish and experiencing different cultures and stuff. That's super fun. She keeps yeah, that's thinking how that people... we're going to. That's how people come from France to America and end up eating eating a Big Mac. I'm not 100 sure. I, you know, we had a, <laughs> we actually got to go to a friend's wedding in uh, Germany a couple of years ago, and uh, pretty interesting experience because we don't speak German, but and it was a wedding. We speak Spanish, so I kept wanting to like speak Spanish. Yeah, and I'm like, this is not, not like this is not the same <laughs> at all. So she, uh, so we went over to the, the wedding was all in German, all with. Germans <laughs> and, and but but we're, we're in this we're surrounded in this scenario where like we're the American people who came over for this person's wedding so it was such a unique experience because full German wedding but at the same time the other people there kind of saw kind of took us in because they knew that we'd flown across the world for the people that they loved so it was just a really wow. unique environment where we got kind of like brought in we didn't understand anything that people were saying for the ceremony but um, he came over right out of college and he'd kept coming back a few years in a row. And he'd always talked about how he'd gained like 20 pounds while he was over here <laughs> and then go back to Germany. They totally. Come, he, loved, he was like in love with Taco Bell and Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> yeah. I'm no. like, of all the things to like. Why? Wow. Well, yeah. I, I, I got to say, we do have a late night Taco Bell thing that we'd, we'd 
I mean, I like, I, like, I do like Taco Bell. I'm not going to yeah. lie. But like to be my favorite thing. Yeah. In like America, the thing you go to another name uh, or another country for just because of, no. they have Taco Bell. Yeah. Dude, when you guys did the wedding in Germany, uh, we're over there. Did they, did they do the plate breaking ceremony? Mm-mm. Mm-mm, no, they didn't. You didn't see that? Like mm-hmm. bring, bring plates down. They start busting porcelain and no. stuff. That sounds mm-hmm. fun though. See that? No, I went to a wedding in Germany and it, all this stuff in German. I had no idea what was going on. They brought like this big old thing of plates out and, uh, and into the driveway of this house and they would say something in German, then they would break a plate. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what is going on? And I still don't understand what it was. And at some point they like ran out of plates and somebody went and got like a 